Welcome to today's Informed Infrastructure Education Webcast Series presentation brought to you by Bentley Systems. Finite Element Modeling and Design of Tub Girder Bridges. I'm Todd Danielson, the Editorial Director of Informed Infrastructure. In this webcast, you will learn about Finite Element Modeling, or FEM, and its role in bridge design. With its superior accuracy and simulation of the structural behavior, FEM is replacing the conventional methods, namely line girder and grillage analysis. Today's featured speaker is Burak Boyachi, PE, the product manager of Leap Bridge Steel at Bentley Systems. His expertise includes modeling and analysis of complex bridges, bridge design, bridge rehabilitation, and evaluation of existing bridges. We'll get started in a few moments, but first let me cover a few housekeeping items. The materials in this webcast have been reviewed by our editorial staff. However, the views of the speakers and their organizations are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of V1 Media or its media outlet, Informed Infrastructure. If you have not done so already, please turn off your pop-up blocker now. If you have any technical difficulties while viewing this webcast, please submit questions or a brief explanation of your technical problem using the Ask a Question box at the bottom of your screen, and a representative will assist you. You also can submit questions to our speakers using the same Ask a Question box at the bottom of your screen. Submit your questions at any time, and we'll try to answer as many as we can later in the broadcast. You also can download the presentation and related materials via the same row of webcast tools. Informed Infrastructure encourages group learning for our events. If you are viewing the live webcast with a group on one person's registered computer, that person must complete and submit the multiple viewer registration form for the group in order for everyone to earn credit. To download the document, click on the multiple viewer registration form button toward the bottom of your screen. Submission instructions are on the form. At the end of the event, we'll provide a webcast evaluation survey for submitting your feedback. Your feedback is vital to help us improve our services and deliver more topics that interest you. Thank you for joining us and enjoy a brief message from today's sponsor, Bentley Systems. Around the world, engineers and architects, constructors and owner-operators are using Bentley software solutions to design, build and operate the infrastructure that sustains our economy and our environment. Together, we are advancing infrastructure. Hello everyone, and welcome to today's presentation. I'm Todd Danielson, the Editorial Director of Inf Infrastructure. You just saw me on that video, and I'll also be moderating the Q&A portion later in this webcast. So I'd first like to thank Bentley Systems, and especially our featured speaker, Barack Boyachi, for taking the time and making the effort to allow this webcast to happen. First, we're going to start with a couple of quick polling questions. The first question is for everyone. What bridge software do you currently use for steel design? The possibilities are Bentley's Leap, CSI Bridge, MDX, Midas, Bentley's STAD, or other. So please take a moment and click on um, which bridge software you currently use. And while you're doing that, uh, also feel free to take some time and familiarize yourself with the console. In addition to the very important Q&A box in your lower right, where you can at any time ask questions for our speaker, there's also a section called Handouts where you can download all of the presentation slides. You can see um, some other information about the software that's being discussed and a lot of other great information there. So if you have some time, check that out. And we're going to move on to the next question. Okay, so here we go. Here's the other question is, um, which type of projects do you currently work on? Do you, do you use either, are you working on steel projects or concrete projects? So again, please take a, a moment to, to choose which one of those that you, you work on. And again, if you have some time, another important section is at the very bottom of the interface, you'll see several black square buttons. An important one is the multiple view registration form, which if you're watching this with several other people, you'll need to download that and fill it out for everyone to get credit for this event. Um, that's the second to the right button, and uh, there's several other buttons down there that you can use on. So with that, we're going to move on and take a little bit of a look at these results and see what we have. Okay, so it's pretty split almost evenly. So 
we've got about 50%, a little 50% with steel, and just under 50% with concrete. So very, very even. So I think Barack's going to have a lot of stuff to talk to you guys. It's going to be very applicable. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Barack Boyacci, CE, the product manager of LeapBridge Steel with Bentley Systems. Barack, all yours. Thank you, Todd. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Barack Boyacci. Uh, I am the product manager of LeapBridge Steel at Bentley Systems. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about finite element modeling of steel bridges and steel top girder bridges. First, I will start with the fundamentals and the typical FEM procedure, and then I'm going to introduce and compare three different analysis types of bridges. After that, I'll show you how LeapBridge Steel performs 3D FEM analysis. In the second part of this webinar, I will elaborate advantages, analysis, and components of steel top girder bridges. And then I'll move on and introduce main design checks required for steel top girders according to actual bridge design specifications. Finally, I'll demonstrate how top girder analysis and design are done using Lipper Steel. Let me start with FEM, finite element modeling. Finite element modeling is a numerical method to analyze different types of structures with different geometries. It can be used for many disciplines. However, we will only concentrate on its structural analysis applications today. Uh, in FEM, physical models cut into several finite number of simple elements, such as lines, triangles, rectangles, and solids. Let me introduce the fundamentals of FEM. Uh, in structural analysis, we are simply looking for a solution for forces and stresses on a structural member for its structural deformation, simply the deflection. This can be presented using a spring analogy, as you see from the slide. For this problem, stiffness and the force exerted on the spring are given, and the unknown here is the displacement. By arranging and resolving the simple equation, displacement could be obtained very easily. However, the structures we are dealing with in the real world much more complicated and impossible to represent with a single or simple equation. Now FEM gets into the picture here. It divides the structure into smaller and simpler elements, then it connects the simpler elements at the connecting nodes. It creates equations for all finite elements, and at this point, each finite element has a simpler equation that represents the behavior of that particular element. When these elements are combined to represent the actual structure, there is a finite number of equations, there's a finite number of equations to be solved at the node. Uh, as it is stated before, uh, the finite elements are connected to each other at the nodes. By connecting the elements at the nodes, unknown quantity becomes interpolated over the structure in a piecewise fashion. Uh, here is the typical FEM procedure. Um, it starts with selecting the analysis type. It can be used for structural analysis, model analysis, or analysis for other disciplines, such as fluid dynamics or maybe thermal problems. However, we are only concentrated on structural analysis as mentioned before. It is followed by the decision of what type of elements to be used in the model. It can be one-dimensional beams and trusses, two-dimensional shell plates or membranes, or three-dimensional solids. After the selection of the element type, material properties, such as modules of elasticity, should be assigned to each element. Then, to build the model and the geometry desired, the nodes and the elements interconnected by the nodes should be defined. After that, um, the support, or could be referred as boundary conditions in this case, and the load are to be defined. Now, uh, we have all given we need in this equation. We have stiffness, since we defined the geometry and the material properties, and we have the forces. 
the equations from the finite element now could be solved for the unknown quantity, which is the displacement in our case at each node. Then each individual result could be combined to obtain global structural response, such as displacement, forces, or stresses. As you already know, SEM has many advantages for engineering applications. Um, let me start with one of them. It is the ability to handle complex geometries, such as curved bridges, specific to our application. It also can be used to solve indeterminate structures where the static equilibrium equations are not sufficient. One other important advantage of it is the ability to adjust mesh size, which uh, basically drive the size of the finite element. Typically, the smaller the mesh size or the smaller the element, the more accurate the result. As you can see from the slide, the true deflection result can be achieved only if the member is divided into elements which are small enough. However, note that the finer the mesh, the more elements generated, meaning more equations to be solved. Therefore, um, the analysis time increases with the finer meshing. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, there are three main types of analysis used for bridges. One of them is the line girder analysis. It is the most basic and the simplest method. Uh, just one dimensional beams, beam elements are defined to represent a single girder. By doing so, there is no interaction with the rest of the bridge, such as cross frame, bracing, or other girder elements. Also, superimposed dead load distribution is an approximation in this method. And in fact, different states have different policies how to distribute superimposed dead load on the bridge. Also, live load distribution is approximated using actual live load distribution factor. Since the girder is modeled as a one dimensional member, curvature effects and the flange lateral bending values are estimated using approximate equation. Bridge analysis is the second type of SEM analysis type um, that we will cover. In this method, a grid of girders, cross frames, and deck slab is created in a two-dimensional plane. All of the members are here defined using beam elements. Due to the presence of cross frames and deck slabs as the transverse members, there is interaction between girders which simulates a better structural behavior than line girder analysis. However, since all members are in the same two-dimensional plane and the dimension for the depth of the structure is missing, torsional stiffness of the structure is still not represented very well. In addition, since cross frames are modeled using a single beam element, still a post-processing and approximation is necessary to obtain individual cross frame member forces. The third and the last analysis type is the 3D SEM analysis. In this analysis type, typically the deck and the web are modeled using shell elements. Flanges can be modeled using either shell or beam elements, as you see from this figure. Since the structures are modeled in three dimensions, the depth of the structure is also modeled. The torsional behavior of the structure captured better than the other two analysis types. Also, since the individual cross frame members are modeled using beam elements and the flanges are analytically modeled, unlike line girder and girder analysis where a beam is just used to define the entire girder, cross frame forces and the flange lateral bending results are more accurate because they are directly obtained from the analysis results. Here's a comparison between three analysis types which we just covered. Um, this data is taken from NCHRP 725 report. Uh, this report and the tables presented focus on curved and skewed bridges. The performances of line girder analysis and grillage analysis are presented with respect to 3D SEM analysis results. As you can see from the table on the left for I girder, Cross frame, 
Flange lateral bending cross frame and flange lateral bending approximations are very poor compared to the calculated values from 3D FEM analysis. Also, if you look at the table on the right, for top girders, torsional behavior approximated by line girder and girder analysis is very poor compared to 3D FEM analysis results. Now, uh, I would like to introduce how lead bridge still performs 3D FEM analysis for steel bridges. Currently, um, in lead bridge steel, deck and web are modeled using shell elements. However, top and bottom flange elements are modeled using beam elements for eye girders, but the bottom flange of top girders are modeled using shell elements, you can see from the check. Reprit still offers an automatic meshing feature in which the user can define the maximum size of mesh separately for deck and girder web. And the program executes the meshing of the structure automatically according to the maximum sizes provided by the user. Therefore, you don't need to do the meshing manually. The program automatically does it for you. It also offers the control of mesh element tolerance. Um, mesh element tolerance is to avoid very slim mesh elements, which could cause erroneous results. If somehow two mesh lines get too closer to each other, closer than the tolerance input, the mesh automatically converges two lines to avoid uh, slim elements and erroneous results. Analysis results in Libre Steel are presented in both graphical and tablet formats, uh, which includes displacement, shear, forces, and moments, etc. Also, as it was mentioned previously, the individual cross frame forces can be directly obtained from analysis results. Therefore, without any post processing, cross frame members can be designed using directly obtained forces from, uh, from 3D FEM analysis. Now I would like to show you a quick demo of 3D FEM analysis using Libre Steel. Um, in order to focus on analysis here, I'm going to skip most of the modeling steps, but only show some important ones. Uh, the more, do more detailed modeling steps will be introduced in my second demonstration. So let's start. You see a, a three span continuous eye girder bridge on a curved alignment here. It has four girders and X type cross frames in between. If you would like to see how the alignment is set, uh, you see the curved alignment with a radius of 700 feet. We can go to the member groups and see how the girders are laid out on the plan view. Under the member definition dialog box, you will see how the plate girders are defined. And if you want to see the full uh, framing plan and where the cross frames are uh, located, you can go into this dialog box. Now we are going to jump to the analysis results. We'll skip modeling steps. As you see under the analysis options, there are three analysis types, line girder, grillage, and finite element. Finite element here uh, refers to 3D FEM that we just covered. If you go to the FEM meshing settings, you see uh, you can define the maximum deck mesh size here. You can change it depending on your needs. You can define maximum girder web size. And you can also define mesh element tolerances that I just described in the previous slide. Uh, this is to avoid slim elements that could cause erroneous results. Now we can look at the how the analytical model looks how the auto meshing uh, performs for this setting. As you see, uh, girders and deck are auto meshed uh, with Libre Steel. And uh, as you 
can see this is a finer mesh. But if you go back to the FDM meshing settings and change the mesh size to let's say 12 feet for deck and five feet for girder, you will see coarser mesh. As you see it's much coarser now for webs and decks. So it's completely user controllable option. I'm going to change this back to the default settings before I run it. And here are the analysis results. What we see here is the displacement results due to deltoid of steel in the initial stage. We can also see shear values or bending moment values, again for deltoid of steel in the initial stage. Or we can change the stage to final stage, and we can see um, superimposed dead loads or fly load results here. Alternatively, uh, we can see the analysis results in a tabular format, as you see here. Uh, you can see the flange lateral bending values. Also, these are directly read from the analysis results. And all of these reports can be exported to PDF or Excel spreadsheets if uh, post-processing post is required later. We can also get the cross train forces, as you see, very easily. And we can also obtain live load results for a certain member and for a certain load case, such as HL93. So this concludes my uh, the first part of this webinar. Uh, let me continue with the second part, which is the steel top girder bridges. Approximately more than 90% of the steel bridges in the US are eye girder bridges. However, um, in the past 20 years or so, the popularity of the steel top girder bridges is increasing um, due to certain advantages of this bridge type, especially in third alignment. Okay, span ranges are, uh, for longer span ranges, could be achieved with more economical way due to its very wide bottom flange. Typically, 150 to 500 feet is accepted as the economical span range for top girder. On the other hand, uh, torsional rigidity is another advantage. The deck and the steel top girders together create a cloth shape, which is very stiff for torsion. It makes them ideal for use in third alignment. When it comes to economy and construction, uh, although the initial fabrication costs of top girders are higher than eye girders, direction costs of top girders are less since there are less pieces to handle. This also reduces the construction duration. Also, the top girders are more stable uh, during the construction compared to eye girders. When it comes to durability and maintenance, uh, since many elements of top girders are located inside the closed section, they exhibit greater durability than eye girders. Also, the exterior surfaces are um, less susceptible to corrosion since there are less details for debris accumulation. Aesthetics is also another advantage. Um, as you know, top girders can provide a smooth appearance since the bracing and stiffness members are hidden within the closed box, uh, which minimizes the exposed steel surface. Now, if you look at the disadvantages, um, top girders are more difficult to inspect compared to eye girders. Uh, typically, the depth of top girders should be at least five feet for inspection. Also, the top girder inspection is riskier than I got inspections due to enclosed space hazard. The initial fabrication cost is also higher than I got as more details are handled in the shop. Uh, top girders are heavier picked for the trains compared to I got um, If you simply assume that a single top girder is equal to two I got it's uh, much heavier picked. Here's a 
comparison, again, between tree analysis type. Um, this data is, again, taken from NCHRP 725 report. According to the performance grade shown on the table, torsional behavior, top flange lateral bracing forces, and internal cross frame forces approximated by line girder and girder analysis are very poor compared to 3D FEM analysis. Please note that the top flange lateral bracing and internal cross frames are not modeled in line girder and girder analysis. However, forces on them are approximated using some methods. Let me introduce um, some of the top girder components and their functions. Internal cross frames, uh, for example, they are used to control cross section distortion. They are also bracing the top flanges of top girders during construction since the deck is not placed yet or it's not hardened yet. External cross frames are used to control differential deflection during construction. In some cases, for aesthetic reasons, it may be desirable to remove the external cross frames after the deck hardens. But some engineers do not recommend to do so. The reasons are uh, there may be a big lactin forces in external cross frames during construction. It may cause problems when you remove them. Removing them may increase stress at the deck, or you may need them for a future deck replacement. Top flange lateral bracing is needed um, since it creates a quasi closed section with the other members of top girder. And as a result of that, it increases the torsional stiffness during the construction before the deck placement. That's why top girders are more stable than eye girders during construction. Um, one more thing, although it's not shown in the picture here, uh, there's another component, uh, which is the bottom flange longitudinal stiffener. As you know very well, since the bottom flange is very wide and slender, bottom flange longitudinal stiffener increases the buckling resistance of the bottom flange. It is typically a WT section or a plate. Um, according to Ashtel RFD bridge design spec, uh, main design checks to be performed for top girders are listed in this slide. Let me start with the cross-section proportion limit. D over TW is the practical limit for web slenderness. And this limitation changes from 150 to 300, depending on the presence of longitudinal stiffness attached to the web. Also, uh, there are some other limitations regarding the flange proportion. Flange proportions are for making sure flange does not distort uh, after welding to the web. Also, having thicker flanges than web provides restraints for web shear buckling. Another limitation is related to slope of the inclined web. Inclination of the web plate shall not exceed the one to four ratio. Uh, as an ad additional thing, uh, the bottom flanges should extend one inch beyond the web plate at least one inch beyond the web plate for welding. Constructability checks. Since the deck is still wet and not active during construction, a part of the bridge, or maybe the entire bridge, uh, has non-composite top sections at this stage. Therefore, without the contribution of the deck stiffness, flanges of the top girders may experience high stresses. Especially the top flanges in the positive flexure regions are susceptible to buckling during this stage. Therefore, it is very important to simulate the actual deck placement in the bridge model. Here you can see the constructability checks for top flanges of top girders um, according to HW design spec. Because of the similarity of the top flanges of eye girders and top girders, constructability checks for top girders are a reference to eye girder sections in actual design spec. As you see, the, um, the reference to the equations are from 6.10 sections. 
in these equations, uh, let me introduce two variables. Uh, FU is the bending stress due to major axis moment, and FL is the flange lateral bending stress. The equations listed under top flanges and compression are for checking the um, flange yielding, flange buckling, and wet band buckling. And if the top flanges are in tension, they are checked for, <coughs> excuse me, they are checked for flange yielding. Um, note that flange lateral bending stresses are considered in these equations. This is because the deck concrete is not hardened and it's not fully breaking the top flanges of the top during construction. Lateral, lateral bracing is only provided by the internal cross frames and the top flange lateral bracing during this stage. Uh, in this slide, we are looking at the constructability check for bottom flanges. We already covered top flanges in the previous slide. Now we are looking at the bottom flange check. Using these equations, compression flanges are checked for flange buckling and wet band buckling, and tension flanges are checked for flange yielding. As you know, top girders have very wide bottom flanges, which makes them very slender. And as you know, slender plates are susceptible to buckling. Therefore, longitudinal bottom flange stiffeners are used to reduce the slenderness of the bottom flange by increasing the stiffness of the bottom flange and also by decreasing its unbraced length. As you see from the sketch, W replaces with EFC in the slenderness ratio equation if longitudinal stiffeners exist. Please also note that um, the tension check includes flange shear stresses due to San Juan and torsion. As I mentioned previously, San Juan and torsion is very important for the top girder bridges. Um, however, um, tension check typically does not govern for the constructability. Shear resistance of the web should also be checked during construction. However, um, it will be covered under tank limit state checks uh, later in this webinar. Okay, for service limit state checks, um, ASHTO section 611.4 refers, refers to service limit state section for eye girders. In these checks, if the longitudinal tensile stress does not exceed two times the modulus of rupture of concrete, the deck may be assumed effective. And composite, composite section properties can be used for stress calculations. Also, Compressive stress in the deck cannot exceed 60% of the strength of the deck concrete. For this limit state check, both flanges are checked for flange yielding and wet band buckling. Uh, if you see in the six, equation 610422-2, there is a, a flange lateral bending stress uh, variable. However, it's only applicable to eye girder bridges and not applicable for top girder bridges. That's why it's crossed out. Strength limit state. Um, strength limit state has different checks depending on the sign of the flexor of the section. Positive flexor has different checks and negative flexor has different checks. Uh, for the sections and positive flexor, first, it starts with the compactness check of the section. Top girder sections can be classified as compact sections if the bridge is straight, if the yield strength of the steel is more than 70 KSI, if the web is not slender, and if it passes to other geometric checks. Uh, the important thing here is the, the compact sections in positive flexor region are permitted to exit the moment at first yield, so they can go plastic. These are the compact and non-compact section checks for sections in positive flexor. Uh, as I mentioned previously, the compact sections in positive flexor region are permitted to exceed the moment at first yield. Um, Non-compact section checks are based on the flange yielding stresses rather than moment capacities of the entire section. Uh, please note that the bottom flange resistance has San Juan and torsion components also. However, San Juan and torsion stresses are resisted by the deck at the top and it has no effect on the top flange resistance. Uh, 
Uh, sections and negative lectures. Uh, these checks are similar to the constructability checks. However, since the deck continuously braces the top flange in the final condition, flange lateral bending is not a concern. That's why we don't see a cell in these equations. Typically, the buffering of bottom flange controls this check. Um, as I mentioned previously, bottom flanges of top girders are very slender, and by adding a longitudinal stiffener to the bottom flange, this slenderness ratio could be reduced. Uh, for the strength limit state, uh, in addition to the flexure checks, shear resistance of the web should also be checked. Uh, as I mentioned previously, and when a torsion produces shear stresses at all elements of the top girder. Therefore, in addition to the shear forces due to flexure, shear forces due to someone and torsion should also be considered. Um, as you can see from the sketch, um, while and when a torsion decreases the total shear force on one web, it increases the total shear force on the other web. Um, Please note that the shear force used in this check should be the, the force along the inclined web, not the vertical shear. Now, I would like to show you a demonstration of top girder modeling, analysis, and design using Lipri Steel. I'm going to go through the major modeling steps in Lipri Steel during this demonstration. Um, you will see how easy and straightforward it is to model a top girder bridge. Uh, design it and analyze it using Lippy Steel. Let me start. Uh, here's the free span continuous uh, curved steel top girder bridge. This is already uh, modeled, it's completed, but uh, I would like to go over the modeling steps with you. Let's start with the alignment. Uh, you can define the shape of the alignment, tangent or curve, and define a radius here if necessary. And then you can move on to the profile, and you can enter your profile information, uh, stationing or elevation here. You can manually adjust. Under the cross section, you can define the your bridges cross section here, and enter super elevations. Uh, in this case, there is 5% super elevation. And for the roadways dialog box, you combine alignment, profile, and cross-section information to complete the roadway definition. Instead of doing this all of this manually, uh, you can pretty much read the, these information from other civil files, alignment and profile. It's very easy. You don't need to do this uh, manually every time. Alternatively, you can read from EGN files and bring alignment profiles and cross-sections to the Lipri steel directly. Let's start with the superstructure definitions and uh, look at the pier abutment locations. This is where you can define the locations of your pier and abutment along the alignment you previously defined. And for the deck slabs, you can define deck thickness, punch thickness, and also different parts of the slab separately, slab one through five here. Uh, can be used for uh, deck placement sequence. Under the deck slab reinforcing, um, you can define the deck slab reinforcing for uh, longitudinal and transverse direction. Under member groups, you can define the number of girders, overhang, and spacing. You can also see from the viewer how the girders are laid out with respect to alignment and with respect to the uh, edges of the deck. Under the member definition, uh, this is where you define all of your girders. Um, specific to top girders, you define bottom flanges, webs, and top flanges with their material, material properties, thicknesses, and length. Uh, and whatever you defined in the tabular format, you can see on the right-hand side with a little sketch.
for the cross frame uh, locations, you can see the entire framing plan with uh, how the cross frames are laid out here, external and internal for subgirders. And um, all of this entry could be done manually or you can use the location wizard for the bulk location. Um, also, top flange lateral bracing is also defined here in between internal cross frames. Now we'll take a look at the bearings um, in Libre Steel. It's a uh, user has the choice of choosing a single or double bearing for subgirders. And it can change from support to support. For example, abutment, in, at abutments you can define double bearings and in piers you can define single bearings. Under the load dialog box, uh, this is where you define all of your load cases. Some of them are automatically created. And then on the left-hand side, uh, you create your load combinations uh, using the load cases on the right. Now if you look at the deck placement sequence, um, as you see, slab one through five is uh, listed and they're all assigned to the single stage. However, we may want to change this and uncheck slab one and slab five and add another stage to include slab one and five in a separate stage. This is how we do the placement sequence. Uh, for the simplicity, we are going to add all of the stages, um, all of the slabs in, in a single stage. If we go to the analysis window, as you see, finite element is the only option here because of its superiority uh, against line girder and grillage analysis. And this is how the analytical model looks like with decks and your top girders. Let us run the analysis. Here are the analysis results. Um, you can see the displacement of the initial stage due to self rate of steel with contours. You can also see shear or moment diagrams. And we can change the uh, staging as well. Uh, we can go to stage one, we just covered and look at the bending moment diagrams. And in the final, we can look at the live load results and superimposed dead load results. Alternatively, these uh, results can be seen in uh, tabular format, like I mentioned in the first demo. And these results can be exported to Excel or PDF for the post-processing required. Now we are ready to run design checks for this subgirder. All of the design checks I have covered so far is going to be reported uh, in the Lipid Steel report. If you go to design check report, select the member that you want to do design check and select the combination that you want, say string one. And you can select report um, from the variety of reports you can select, let's say strength unit stage. And within a matter of seconds, we get the all necessary checks required for strength limit state that I just covered. As you see, this is not like a black box and you can see all of the steps and equations how the design check is performed. Also, these reports can be exported to PDF for reporting purposes or Excel spreadsheet for post-processing if required. Since we have the cross-frame uh, forces, uh, we can directly design them using Libre Steel. So <clears throat> this concludes my um, second demonstration here. Let me share some exciting news with you. Uh, I'd like to introduce our latest bridge product, Open Bridge Modeler. It is the heart of Bentley's beam for bridges. Uh, this is a microstation-based product and is used to create 3D intelligent parametric physical models of bridges. Open Bridge Modular models are interoperable 
with other Bentley products such as Open Road Designer, Leap Bridge Concrete, Leap Bridge Steel, RM Bridge, and Pro Structures. Open Bridge Modular generates, generates several useful reports such as material quantities and costs, chamber diagrams, and deck elevations. It can also, uh, also generate several drawings such as typical bridge cross section and tier elevation using micro stations dynamic view technology. So in the previous demo, all of the modeling steps you went through, uh, you don't have to do all of them. If you have a physical model uh, modeled in open, open bridge modular, you can directly send that model to LeapBridge Steel and your model is ready to go. You can run analysis and design quickly and then if there will be any changes to the sections uh, due to design check, you can make those changes and then send that model back to OpenBridge Modular for the use of other purposes. I encourage you to try OpenBridge Modular if you have not already done so. I also would like to take this opportunity to invite all of you to ask the expert sessions with Bantry Systems' very own bridge expert, Alex Mabrick. These recurring sessions happen every Thursday, um, and Alex will be more than happy to answer your questions and help you with your project-specific issues during these sessions. Please reach out to Alex if you're interested. <clears throat> Excuse me. You can also follow Bantry Systems and a variety of uh, social media channels such as YouTube, uh, Twitter, Facebook, or LinkedIn. Also, we have a very special promotion on LeapBridge Steel only for the attendees of this webinar. If you would like to get more information about this unique opportunity, please contact Barbara Day uh, from the email address on the slide or expect an email from us soon regarding this promotion. So now I will turn it over to Todd. Todd? Thank you, Barack. That was, that was great. You did an excellent job with that presentation. Now I hope the rest of you found that as educational as I did because uh, I learned a lot. We're going to start things off after, before we get to the Q&A with one quick poll question for our audience. Please fill this out so that we can get uh, back to you in a better way and a more efficient way for those who are looking for more information. The question is, would you like to be contacted by a technical expert to discuss your bridge project? And again, while you're, while you're answering that, uh, if you haven't already asked your questions for the, for the speaker, um, now is the time to put that into the, uh, the question box because we're going to get to those very shortly. All right, we'll give that time there. Okay, so... Barack, we're going to begin our um, questions and answers. The first question is pretty simple. Which version of LeapBridge Steel were you using when you made your presentation? It's uh, version 17 uh, that is just released uh, about a month ago at the end of June. That is version 17. Okay, great. And so is LeapBridge Steel interoperable with OpenBridge Modeler? Yes, it is uh, interoperable with OpenBridge Modeler. Uh, as I mentioned in the presentation, uh, instead of going through all of the modeling steps um, that we went through, the OpenBridge Modular model, physical model, can be transferred to LeapBridge Steel, and everything is ready to run, analysis and design. Okay, great. So what is the difference between the LEAP program and the RM program for bridge analysis and design? It's a very good question. Uh, we are getting out of these questions. Uh, let me explain it. Uh, Leap Bridge Leap program uh, consists of um, two products, very much Leap Bridge Concrete and Leap Bridge Steel. Uh, they are for everyday bridges, mostly conventional bridges. Uh, however, RM can do much more than that. Uh, for the analysis part. It can do um, table state bridges, it can do segmental bridge analysis, etc. This is the difference. Okay, thank you, Barack. So here's a question now. Do you need to enter the live load distribution, I think, factor, or will the model generate it? Okay. Um, I covered three types of analysis. Um, the line girder analysis, village analysis, and SEM analysis. Only 
line order analysis require you to input live load distribution factor that was um, that was calculated by using actual equations. Gurley then FEM analysis distributes to live load live load automatically and um, you can directly get the analysis result, live load analysis results for each girder. All right, excellent. So what are some major differences between Leap Ridge and Midas? Um, Leap Ridge steel is mostly, as the name implies, it's concentrated on steel bridges. And Leap Ridge steel is um, providing more detailed um, analysis results and more detailed design check reports. Although Midas is more general, it's uh, more of a competitive of RM bridge. But we can provide more detailed uh, answers to, to this question after the, after the webinar. Thank you, it's All a very right, good question. Uh, so we're getting several requests on when they can download the, the certificate of completion. That will be after the Q&A, so that'll be just in a few minutes and there'll be a slide notifying you of when it's available and you'll need to click on uh, that or the, the icon at the bottom of the screen. So we've got time for some more questions. So Brock, this one's more of a statement and perhaps you can um, make, some, make some notes about it and hopefully you can maybe read along because it's, it's got some technical details there that I, I hopefully won't screw up too bad. Uh, the statement is, I wish to emphasize the importance of never using a longitudinal web stiffener. It has an E fatigue detail. You have to roll it to the bottom flange. It's horrible to inspect. No owner should allow a longitudinal bottom flange stiffener. Maybe you can comment on that and correct all the uh, the errors I made translating that for you. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's actually a good point. Um, I'm not sure if he's talking about the longitudinal web stiffener or longitudinal bottom flange stiffener, but uh, it is correct that it creates some fatigue detail, but you know, uh, it also has some advantages and disadvantages, so it's up to the designer to choose uh, which one. Okay, thanks. So here's another question. How does the FEA model represent the girder bearings? Either one or two bearing per pier? Question. Are there any dimensions, material properties, or also additional elements? Uh, okay, this is a very good one. Um, so in our analytical model, we are not physically or analytically modeling the bearings. Bearings are uh, either pin support or uh, fixed support. Uh, Support like point point support, pretty much. Uh, but this is another another thing in our list. So we are considering adding the um, bearing analysis as well in Leapridge Steel. But very good question. Okay, next question. Can I use grillage analysis for tub girder bridges? Um. Yes, you can, uh, but. As I showed in my comparison tables in the presentation, it's not recommended. Uh, you have to do a lot of approximations to, uh, for example, top flange lateral bracing is not defined, internal uh, cross frames are not modeled in the grillage, and all of those values require estimations and approximations. And those members are actually uh, affecting the cross sectional behavior cross-sectional distortion behavior of the section. So um, the, as you see from the, the, the previous slides, uh, the results are kind of off for grillage. That's why in Lipper Steel, we are not offering grillage analysis, but only uh, 3D FEM analysis for top girders. All right, we're getting a lot of great questions, so everyone keep, keep them coming. The next one is, for the FEM analysis, will the program give you the live load distribution values it calculates for a particular node of a girder? Uh, this is also a good question, uh, but answer to this is no. Uh, the distribution is automatic in FEM, and it's not providing the distribution factors. But what you can do is, um, as an alternative to this, you can take a look at the uh, loading details and you can find out where the truck is located on the bridge um, when the um, highest reactions obtained from the bridge.
Okay, great. So does LeapBridge still have support for other codes? They mentioned CSA or Euro code. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, we are not supporting other codes at the moment, but um, it's definitely in our list. Uh, we want to include Euro code uh, and Canadian code as well. So very good question. Thank you. Okay, so here's the one. What are the most common grades of steel for tub girders? Most common grade of steel? Yes, that, it's that's typically, correct. Um, I think it's typically 50 KSI rate. Okay, here's another technical question. What is the optimum size for deck meshing for 3D FEM? Uh, okay, this actually um, depends. <laughs> there is no optimum size for deck meshing. Uh, it depends on user needs. Um, if you want to run a quick analysis, you can do coarse mesh and get the analysis quicker by sacrificing accuracy a little bit. If you want the accuracy on the spot, you can increase the, decrease the mesh size and you get a finer mesh and you get a better result, but then you are sacrificing analysis time. So in Leapbridge still what we did is uh, we decided to have a maximum of four, four by four feet deck mesh size. Uh, we believe that this is the sweet spot uh, between the accuracy and analysis time for uh, many small to medium sized bridges. Okay, great. So we've still got a few more minutes. You can keep turning those questions in. We're getting a bunch. Here's another. Why are lateral bending stresses not considered on the bottom flange of tub girders? Um, very good question, again. Uh, one reason is the, uh, it's basically, there's one reason. The, the web is restraining the uh, flange lateral bending from the end. Uh, at the bottom flange girder. That's why the those stresses are negligible for the bottom flange. Okay, great. So is a square tub easier to fabricate than a slanted or tapered tub? Uh, I believe they are um, because I guess the welding is easier if, if it's a square box section. Um, but um, in Leapbridge Steel, we are only offering tub girders, uh, not the square box section. Okay, great. So does Leapbridge Steel consider deck placement sequence for tub girder analysis? Oh, yes, it does. It definitely does. Uh, as I explained in the, um, in the webinar, um, you can define, you can separate the deck into different parts, and each part can be added to the bridge on the non-composite sections uh, within a certain stage that, that is user controllable. And Lippert still simulates this, this action. Okay, great. So here's a question that's looking maybe just for a little bit of clarification. It says, so at this time, you cannot use a spring for a support? Is that correct or not correct? It is not correct. Uh, you can define directional springs instead of uh, instead of pin support or roller support or fixed support. You can still define directional springs. Okay, here's another one. What is the minimum practical height of tub girders? Uh, minimum practical height of tub girders is um, five feet. And this minimum height is required for the accessibility for inspections inside the top. Okay, um, we're getting very close. So I'm going to go ahead and, and advance the slides so that they can uh, download their uh, certificate of completion. So you guys can go ahead and start downloading that. It should be available. And in the meantime, while people are doing that, perhaps we can get into one or two more questions. I can sort them all through. We got so many that it's, it's proving to be a little bit difficult to see um, through all the, the great questions that came in. All right, here's here's another one. Is CAD model used for leap bridge steel analysis accessible? I think I butchered that. Uh, yes, this is, 
this is a very good question. Actually, uh, Leapix still uses head engine to run the analysis, create the analytical model, run the analysis. And uh, if it's desired, um, Leap, uh, head files are being created in the temp folder and users can go ahead and find these stat files and open the model instead. All right, that's fantastic. Thank you, Brock. So I believe we're, we're at the top of the hour, and so we'd like to thank everyone for joining us. I know that we all have busy schedules and, and, and lots to do, so we're going to wrap up here. If, if your question did not get answered today, either Brock or someone else from the Bentley team will get back to you personally to, to see that your questions are answered. We only have just so much time in the, in the webcast to get to as many as we can. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank you again for attending today's webcast. If you haven't already, you can now download your certificate of completion to get your PDH credit. And after this is over, if you can spare just a few moments and complete our quick survey, it will greatly help us to improve our webcast, as well as find additional topics that best serve your needs. With that, this ends today's webcast. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day, and please come back for future informed infrastructure educational opportunities. Thank you.